Welcome to the channel, everybody. 1984. It was a pivotal year, wasn't it? And of course, we all know about the book, 1984, and then the subsequent movie that came out, which was all about censorship, the thought policed, and I think everybody knows that right now, in history, it feels like 1984, 37 years later. But what else happened in 1984? Well, I can tell you what didn't happen. The U.S. had not yet entered the Middle East, and they wouldn't for seven more years after 1984. 1991 is when the U.S. would invade Iraq under Bush Sr. And then it happened again under Bush Jr. in 2003. And of course, after all that, we spent 20 years in Gafmanistan. Yet, what I'm going to show you next, depicted in the 1984 film Dune, is a desert war that hadn't happened yet against a king named Shaddam, which sounds like Saddam, and a group called the Muad'Dib, which sounds like the Mujahideen. There's even a planet called Iraqis, which sounds, of course, like Iraq. And what would a movie be about Iraq without jihadists and sleeper cells? All of these things mentioned in Dune 1984, seven years before what happened. There's even a red-haired clown. And his name is Baron. And he desecrates the dunes of Arrakis. And of course, the clown resembles Trump. And of course, the same thing happened with the dunes at his golf course. That he was accused of desecrating. You have to see this with your own eyes to believe it. Now there's a princess who narrates the entire movie. She's played by Virginia Madsen. When was she born? 1961. On Blind 11. 40 years before it would happen. In the Hebrew year. 57. 61. You will even hear them talk about air, air power versus desert power. Watch this. Emperor Shaddam the Fourth. Emperor Shaddam the Fourth. Uh, Shaddam the Fourth. The city of Arakin is under martial law. We have troops here. Headquartered underground. You have one last chance to take matters into your own hands and bring the situation under control on Arrakis. Our new army is still in training, but everything, everything is shielded. And with this shielding, we are impenetrable. The planet is Arrakis, also known as Dune. Now, before we keep going with this, understand that what we're about to enter this morning is a hall of mirrors. You're going to see metaphors of things that mean the exact opposite of the truth. The rest of the troops are stationed in Arakeen, and we have some on the airfield. The new Femen leader, Muad'Dib, has stopped spice mining on Arrakis. You do not have more than this one chance. I represent the entire guild in this matter. Our navigators warn you that spice production is in great danger. The voice from the outer world. The prophecy. One will come. Bringing the holy war. Hidden away within the rocks of these deserts are a people known as the Fremen, who have long held a prophecy. And bring us out of darkness, the Shihad, 
which will cleanse the universe. That a man would come, a messiah, who would lead them to true freedom. It was known that the Harkonnens, the former rulers of Arrakis, would leave many suicide troops behind. House Atreides took control of Arrakis 63 standard days into the year 10,191. This is genocide, the deliberate and systematic destruction of all life. On now, this is crazy. Look at his throne. What is behind the throne? Looks to me a lot like a... We all know what that looks like. Arrakis. My lady, the local people. They will call me Wad Deep. Sleeper must awaken. The sleeper must awaken. We call that one. Muad'Dib. Could I be known as Paul Muad'Dib? You are Paul Muad'Dib. With a storm, their air power will be useless. On Arrakis, it's desert power. Journey. Now, this is Baron, and he's the clown figure who floats around on helium. He's from the house Harkonnen. And he's badly disfigured from probably overdosing on spice. Now, as you're going to see next, the root word of Harkonnen, which is Conan, means to be able to or to know. Probably the root from the word confidence. And of course, that's shortened to the word con, like a con man. Now, the first part of the word Harkonnen is H-A-R which means sarcastic laughter, or it can also mean an army, which is what this Baron does a lot of in the film. Now, aside from Baron having Trump's son's name, are there any other metaphors to compare this guy to? Well, of course, Trump's golf course is in the dunes of Scotland. And just like the Harkonnens, Trump destroyed the dunes. To make way for his luxury golf course. Now all of the Harkonnens have red hair. Which of course denotes a certain ancestry. That seems to line up with the T-Man as well. Let's watch this. You were ordered to kill them. So kill them. Now, this is crazy because we've talked all about this floating air, helium, and we're going to break that down later in the show, but I want you to see what's going on here. This guy floats around, there's a very specific reference here. They want you to see that he's floating on helium. Let's keep watching. Bring in that floating fat man. Baron. There is a Harkonnen among you. So this is the word har, which means laughter with sarcastic connotation, which is what clowns do. It can also mean the leader of an army. And of course, Conan means to know. Now, did we get conned? Of course we did. We looked at the assets and somebody tried to tell me with a straight face that that's just... An investment portfolio package that everybody would have bet on. 
eight different investments all related exactly to the spamdemic. Now that would be, if I was a betting man, that would be a one in a million chance that you could make money on every single one of the investments in your portfolio package with specific companies that relate directly to the spamdemic. But yet, that's what the T-Man was able to do based on his 2016 portfolio package, which was the year that he became president. So, what do the Harkonnens do? That's exactly what they do. They destroy dunes. Because they're miners. They go to the planet Arrakis and they basically go through and harvest the spice melange. Now, what is the spice melange? Well, the planet Arrakis is the only known source of this valuable spice in the universe. It becomes the center of the story of the universe. This is all in the film. Now, does this sound familiar? Sounds a little bit like oil. We're going to break that down later in the decode about what the metaphors are for the oil because it goes deeper than just oil, okay? Now, look at this. So, this is Paul. We're going to get into his character in a bit here too. But look behind him. I counted the soldiers, so you don't have to do it. I mean, you could pause this and recount them if you want to. But there's 58 soldiers behind him. We've seen that number before, haven't we? And what Paul does is he is the Muad'Dib and he summons the worms with sound. What are the worms? There are these massive creatures that cruise around out in the desert of Arrakis. And this is what they harvest this spice from. And so, in order to escape these worms as they're out here mining, they have to basically hide in rocks inside of the sand. And then you have these people, which are the freemen, and they're the ones who are basically well adapted to the desert. And they have a huge invisible army, as you're going to hear next. And they pretty much can't be defeated. Does this all sound familiar to you? It should, because this was the storyline behind Gaff Manistan, wasn't it? And so the future of Dune, Arrakis, is a highly militarized, controlled, draconian dystopia. Same thing depicted in the, in the film 1984. Now I have here that he summons or opens the portal worms with sound. What does that mean? Well, these worms, as we're going to explain to you, are actually synonymous and metaphors for portals. They're hollow. They're massive. They're the fallen trees that once connected us to the garden. That's the metaphor here. I had to think long and hard about this because... It escaped me at first, but basically this is blasphemy. They're making fun of the fallen trees by equating them to these massive worms. The worms actually become portals so that they can time travel in the film. So there's your clue right there. We've already established that, 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 it, that these wormholes, and I'm not talking about what NASA tells us a wormhole is. I'm talking about narrow gates. I'm talking about ways out of this reality this physical reality into the spiritual reality. I'm talking about the many trees of the garden, how they, how Adam and Eve got there before they fell and how they were cut off from those many trees of the garden. The trees are the tree trunks. They're portals into other gardens. Or you can call them worlds. You can call them whatever you want. But God says, my, my place has many rooms in my mansion. What do you think those many rooms are? Do you think you just walk into a room and just hang out there? No, he's talking about worlds. And wouldn't that be an amazing heaven? 
or garden to be able to experience different frames of reality. The only thing was he told Adam and Eve, don't go into that one frame of reality, which the devil controls the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is a tree, which is a tree trunk, which the inside of it looks like the inside of a worm or the inside of a tree trunk, which is a wormhole. Let's keep watching. I suspect an incredible secret has been kept on this planet, that the Fremen exist in vast numbers, and it is they who control our Akis. And it is they who control our Akis. So, hidden enemy with vast numbers, this would be, uh, you know, the, the people in Gafmanistan, okay, undefeatable, many armies have tried, can't do it. Because they rule the desert. It, even air power couldn't couldn't defeat them. Then it is they who control Iraqis. Now, let me make sure you guys are with me before we keep going. This is a very important show. Looks like you are. Okay, let's keep going with this. Now, this is crazy. Because what is all the fuss about... This planet Arrakis or Dune. Well, it's all about this substance called Spice Melange. Which allows those who control it to fold space and time. It's basically, there; it opens portals. And the spice is harvested from this giant worm that you're going to see a little bit later in the decode. And melange technically means medley or mixture. But doesn't the word melange sound a lot like melatonin, the brown substance that's harvested from brains? Well, in fact, the spice is said to taste like brown cinnamon. Remember, this woman's birthday is Blind Eleven. That hadn't happened yet. In this time, the most precious substance in the universe is the spice melange. He's hiding something about the spice. Is there a relationship between the worms and the spice? The spice extends life. The spice expands consciousness. Now, he asked if there was a relationship between the spice and the worms, and of course there is. They admit it in the film later. As to their relationship with the spice, who knows? As I said, they defend the spice hand. The spice is vital to space travel. Use the orange spice gas, which gives them the ability to fold space. The spacing guild and its navigators, who the spice has mutated over 4,000 years, travel to any part of the universe. So, melange is a metaphor for the chrome. And it's obtained through sacrifice. It's given in submission to Satan so that he can open portals of demon possession. So they can possess people. Now you're going to see this whole scenario play out as we continue on with this decode. Without moving. I hold at your neck. A gom jabar. Now, just like the controllers today, in the film there is this fascination with poking us with things and masking us. In this case, she puts this thing up to his neck called a gom jabar. This next part is unbelievable. This is the gom jabar. It's basically a thimble with a needle on it. And from Dune's own website, it's called a forced God medicine is what it stands for. Now, gom, the word gom, which is part of the word gom jabar, as you can see here. Obviously, the jabar part sounds like a jab, but this gom part can also mean like a fool. So it becomes like the fool's jab. Unbelievable. Foreshadowing here going on. 
Let's keep listening. This one kills only animals. Gomjabar, put your hand in the box. Your instinct will be to remove your hand from the box. If you do so, you die. So she's threatening him with a sticker. Your awareness may be powerful enough to control your instincts. Are you suggesting that Duke's son is an animal? Let us say, I suggest you may be human. With a forced medicine. Now, if he's human, then he doesn't get the sticker. Uh, is all this sounding familiar? I'm not sure how much more clear this can be. Now, this is all about fear. This is a fear test. You're going to hear her mention the nervous system. The fear is an illusion. It's the fear of death that makes us do things, isn't it? It's the fear of being told and shown things that makes us do things. Preserving life and losing it. Now, this Gom Jabbar finger sticker reappears a little bit later. Let's watch. You feel an itching. Now, the itching becomes burning. Heat upon heat. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. Face my fear. Yeah. Interestingly, as we sit now, the establishment is angry because many people in America do not have fear. You know, they tell people to be brave and fearless, right? They tell a soldier to go to the military and just trust the people above them. And to be fearless, do as you're told, and to face the enemy. But when it comes to something like not fearing something that's happening around us, or they tell us is happening around us, all of a sudden, we're called stupid, we're called, you don't know what you're talking about, we're forced to do what we don't want to do. Notice the hypocrisy. Now, it's a little bit different, we're not... This is a little bit, you know, a case of apples and oranges, I guess. But when you really think about it, don't people have the right? Even if it means that they could possibly be harmed by something to still do it. I mean, we do it every day in America, right? They show us how many people die of cancer from smoking, but yet they don't outlaw that. A lot more people die of smoking than do any kind of spamdemic, but yet... You know, if, if they wanted to use the same logic that they're trying to use to force everybody to get this, then they would basically outlaw smoking, wouldn't they? But they know they can't do that, nor do they want to, because secretly they actually don't really care if people die of, of smoking. They don't really care. Or you could argue that they just believe that, hey, that's your own personal choice if you want to do that. Well, why doesn't that apply to the sticker? Why is it different? Oh, well, they gave us all these excuses, right? Oh, it's it, it's too it's too taxing on the medical system. Well, isn't cancer taxing on the medical system too? For smoking? Of course it is. But they make money on it. So their excuse falls flat. It just falls completely flat. And that's just one example of the hypocrisy. There's dozens and dozens of more examples of things that they haven't really cared about up to this point about preserving life and now all of a sudden they want to pretend like they care let's keep watching take your hand out of the box and look at it young human so 
he basically refuses the sticker and then that means that he's human still. This is unbelievable. Do it. Pain by nerve induction. Pain by nerve induction. Uh, remember we talked all about the nervous system? Uh, isn't that exactly uh, what they're admitting is one of the possible effects of the sticker? Nerve issues because of the... Uh, well, we'll leave it at that. You guys can fill in the blanks. We've covered enough of it on this channel. So it's interesting that she mentions this in association with a sticker that she's holding up to his neck. A human can resist any pain. Our test is crisis mm -hmm. and observation. A hunter seeker. A hunter seeker. Well, what's he talking about? Well, Paul is in his room. Paul Muadib is his name. And they make an attempt on his life. How? They send in a remote control levitating sticker. This is unbelievable. Can't get me if I don't move. Listen to the sound of this. What does it sound like? It sounds like a rattle, doesn't it? Like a rattlesnake. Remember all, remember everyone, not everyone. I, I need to stop saying that. Remember how, you guys, we're on an oasis here on YouTube. Okay, the people that come to this channel see the truth for what it is. They see the connections because you guys follow the process. You see every video. You see how things keep coming around full circle. And you get it. You're convinced because you know that no one in their right mind could possibly make all of this up on this journey that we've been on. But for the people that don't take the time, they see one video or they see five seconds of a video. And they, they see a claim made and they don't see the connection to all the other things that we've shown. And they immediately discredit the channel. And then they go around and say, that guy's crazy. Or that guy's job is to, you know, he's some kind of insider. He's making everyone look crazy so no one can be taken seriously. That's not what's happening here. What's happening is we're showing you the pre-programming in film by the devil himself to prepare the world for his agenda. That's the simplest way I could describe of what we're doing here. So, why did I get off on that tangent? Well, how many times have I compared the sticker to a serpent? Because the fangs are hollow. And they inject the poison. Just like what you're seeing right here. So now we're hearing the rattlesnake. We're hearing the snake. And the shadow of this thing on the floor looks like a slithering snake. Watch. They're depicting a snake there, aren't they? It's too dark in here for it to see clearly. I've got to try to grab it. The suspenser field will make it slippery on the bottom. <laughs> the, let me let me back that up. This is crazy. The suspenser field will make it slippery on the bottom, like a snake. Make it slippery on the bottom. Who is operating that thing? It has to be someone in the palace. I could shout for help, but it would kill whoever opened the door. Now, the way this thing sees this sticker, this potion sticker is through this lens here which looks like the iris of an eye it's got this uh i don't know i guess you call it a pendulum swinging back and forth across its visual field So he catches this thing in midair before it takes out this lady. And she's a freeman. She's from the desert. And I don't know what freeman, the, the metaphor is there. So you could look at it from both sides. But what was clear to me is that Paul is the Antichrist. He's the false messiah. And he leads the freeman people against the Harkonnens who are trying to defeat him. 
So if you look at this in like the positive light, you could see it like if you were to say that Paul was not like he was the actual real Messiah, then these would be like the Israelites in the desert, right? In the wilderness. But of course, that's not what they're depicting here. They're depicting the Antichrist and his followers in the desert. Let's keep watching here. It's what have killed me. I was his target. He went to the motion. Later, where are you? Now, let's keep going with this. So, this is Paul's mother. And she's captured by the Baron. And he puts a mask on her. Why does he put a mask on her? Because she possesses the ability called weirding. And what is weirding? It's where you can mind control people through voice commands. So you speak and they do what, you, what you're supposed, they ask you to do. So what do they do? They mask her so that she cannot speak and affect their minds. Sounds a lot like censorship, doesn't it? If people were allowed to speak freely, we would live in a much different world. Because you could actually affect change with your voice, right? Now, I know we do. We get a lot done here. We're not speaking as freely as we want to speak. And it's a bit confusing when new people come to the channel because they have to learn the language, don't they? They have to learn the tongue that we speak in. In order to understand what's happening. It's kind of a process. Now. Remember. This is all mirrors. Right? So in, in this film. She's like a witch. And this is like magic that she uses on people. But understand. That what she's really being depicted as. Is, is God's chosen. Who if they were allowed to speak freely. Could help uh, wake up a lot of people. Right? Because it's the word of God you're speaking. You're speaking the truth. And when you speak the truth, the devil runs away in the face of truth. This is why censorship has become so important to these people. They have to silence you. This is why the comment sections are turned off underneath news headlines. Online news headlines. All the comment sections are gone now because they don't want people speaking. Because if you speak, then too many people wake up and then their agenda doesn't work. So we're living in 1984. Later, where are you? What a pity. You must remain gagged. Look at this clown-like uh, attire here. And the fact that he floats on helium. Now we talked a lot about helium and the it clown. Pennywise. We did lots of decodes on that. Because Pennywise would say, you'll float too. That was his famous saying. And he would float on the helium of the dead. Of the people that he took out. That he killed. Up from the sewers. He would float on these balloons. And we had decoded that really what Pennywise represented was death. And the things associated with death that come out of the ground. Now I'll give you my final thoughts on that. At the end of the show. But basically, helium and methane are mined together. Methane is the gas of death, decomposition, and it's very similar to oil. That's all a metaphor for pulling death out of the earth for power. And that's exactly what the devil does with the human race. He pulls, he causes death, and then gains power from it somehow. We can't let ourselves be swayed by your witch's voice now, can we? How simple to subdue us. How simple to subdue us by silencing us. Is this all sinking in now? Silence. Silence of the lambs came to mind. Right now. We move on, Dad. Excellent. There it is. Now, there are many, many, many biblical references in this film. And you're going to see this guy who removes the gag. He takes a knife and pierces the side. 
basically the ultimate betrayal of his friend that is flying the spaceship after they've captured Paul and his mother. They were going to leave them out in the desert to die, but she uses her weirding voice to control his mind, to have him remove the gag, and then he t she tells him to pierce the side and betray his friend. Now, of course, this is the reference to Jesus' side being pierced. The poison blade. The poison blade. Do you know of the water of life? Now, they mention the water of life, and of course, that's the well of life, okay? These are all metaphors, and Paul, this is Paul again, and he's prophesied as the Messiah of the universe. Now, I didn't include clips in here. I don't know why. I must have forgotten those, but basically, they mention his bloodline. It's mentioned early in the film, and that witch that was talking to him, she mentions a breeding program. So I think I have the, uh, oh, here it is here. Here's the breeding program from the Dune website. And it talks about uh, how they basically genetically engineered the bloodline so that Paul Atreides could become the Muad'Dib, Paul the Muad'Dib. The Kwisatch Haderach is what it's called. So, breeding program. This is unbelievable. This is the, exactly what the elite do breeding program to try to have to burden the antichrist this is exactly what this is talking about now let's keep watching here you're going to hear her mention a couple of terms the Gesserit, which sounds a lot like jesuit she mentions hatterak which sounds like hamashiach doesn't it the bile from the newborn worms of arakis the Bene Gesserit sisterhood use it to see within. It is said, a man will come, the Kwisatz Haderach. Many men have tried. He will go where we cannot. Only the water of life will free what can save us. I must drink the sacred water. So Paul takes the sacred water and he's transformed into their leader, which causes his eyes to glow blue, just like the blue bloods, which is everything we've been talking about on this channel for a very long time. And he cries tears of blood, just like our Messiah did. But of course, he's the false Messiah. All of the worms then surround him. These worms are massive, the size of several football fields. They all surround him. And let's keep watching. Traveling without moving. Traveling without moving. Now let's talk about water for a minute because he drinks the water, right? And let's compare this and contrast it to the true well of life which is the true portal back to the Messiah, the true Messiah, okay? So water is the medium that flows through portals. What am I talking about? Well, what does water do when it hits the roots of a tree? It goes up through the roots, through the portal, the tree trunk, and up into the branches, right? Everything in this reality is metaphor. It's all nested meanings, nested realities, things within things, so the portal opens up when Paul drinks the water of life, right? And we'll get into what that means at the end of the show when I give you my final thoughts. I'm basically pre uh, presenting the case here. So where do they get this water of life that Paul mentions? Well, it's harvested from these giant worms who grow to this enormous size, who protect the spice and 
These worms look exactly like a real-life vampiric plant called witchweed or striga. And there's some of this in the Carolinas. They have to burn entire fields of crops to get rid of it. It's called striga. And it basically suffocates the crops from the roots and possesses them, basically. Now I truly control the worm. He controls the worm, which is possession. That's what all this is really about. This is the devil's form of the portal. He can't go up through the portal back to the garden, so he has to, where does he go? He goes d possessing demons, possessing other people through portals of sacrifice. So look at the similarity between the witch weed, the vampiric weed that attaches to roots of plants and basically possesses them. It lets the plant live for a while, but the plant cannot produce any fruit. They get stunted. They're basically possessed. Now, many of you will remember the FX series called The Strain. And it was all about the same thing. They're actually, their tongues look like this when they came out of the mouth of these vampires in the series, The Strain. What were they called? What were the race of beings called that were vampires? They were called Strigoi. Striga, Strigoi. Now we warned about this back in 2017. Told you that the, the FX had tweeted out that the master is here. The master is here. Starting to wonder who that really is. When they tweeted that out, it was on the date of an eclipse. I think it was in August. You can go on their channel right now. FX, The Strain. Go on to their uh, Twitter account. And they said the master is here. What were they talking about? Are they announcing the Antichrist? I don't know. So, let's keep watching here. So, back to Dune. So, these worms eat everything. And they respond to vibration. That's how they're what they're attracted to. And when you really think about what's happening here, vibration disassociating particles into dust. The worms being worm holes, mocking the portals that once connected Earth to the garden. When you really think about what's happening here, the worms in Dune represent these fallen tree trunks that were all cut down after man was cut off from the living waters of the garden in heaven. Remember the streams that went through the Garden of Eden and went in and around the trees of the garden? We're cut off for that, uh, from that and we are effectively living in a desert. Some people ask me, Casey, where is the garden? Well, it ain't here because we're cut off from it. It's outside of us or above us. It could be between us and heaven. I don't know. We're outside the borders of the firmament. But we are definitely cut off from it. And so we are in effect living in a desert. Now there are lots of Egyptian themes running through Dune. 1984. With Paul, of course, being the messianic figure. He's actually given two names. One of his names is Usula, which means the bottom of the pillar. And, of course, in Egyptian ancient writings, they talk about the Jed, D-J-E-D. -E and that is the bottom of the pillar, and it denotes strength. 
and the Egyptians worshipped the jed because it was the bottom of the backbone of a cow. And here's the emperor's uh, palace. It's a flying palace. And, it, and it's partially buried under the sand. Or it lands. At, no, here's his palace here. And it lands on this pyramid. This is landing. Landing strip or whatever. Let's keep watching. Now, this, of course, is an obelisk, and he actually calls it that to another Egyptian reference. But this is Paul, and he raises this army of the freemen in the desert to go against the Harkonnen, which is like the, the Trump character, right? And Paul has this ability to use the spoken word as a weapon. How does he do this? By projecting force through these boxes called weirding modules. So he speaks through this box and it projects force and it can dustify things. Is this starting to all sound familiar? Watch. This obelisk is of your hardest stone. He tells this guy. Punch it, kick it. Corba. Cut it. Cut it. Then he's like, watch this. He pulls out his weirding module. This box. And listen to what he says. Chaksa, which sounds a lot like chakra, again, going back to ancient Egypt. This is part of the weirding way that we will teach you. Through sound and motion, you will be able to paralyze nerves, shatter bones. Some thoughts have a certain sound. So... Now we have some clues into what the elite are really up to. The ability to use sound to destroy. He also has another command, his own name, Muadib. He says it and he can use it through the weirding module to destroy things as well. And of course the word Muadib has the word Mu in it, M-U, like the... CV-19 variant running around, supposedly infecting people. All this goes back to Egyptian roots. It's all happening right now. And the false messiah destroys things with sound. Which is the opposite of creation, isn't it? Because in the beginning was the word. And the word was God and with God. And he created with sound. But the Antichrist will destroy with sound. This is why I've been telling you guys. We didn't talk a lot about it on this particular Blind 11. But everyone can agree that parts of the building turn into dust before they ever hit the ground. In their own footprint, by the way. What kind of technology does that? Well, I think we're getting a little bit of a hint of that in this film here. Dustification. That being the equivalent to a form. <laughs> Set fires, suffocate an enemy or burst his organs. We will kill until no Harkonnen breathes Arakeen air. And his word shall carry death eternal. To those who stand against the righteous. The righteous! I remember your Gom Jabbar. Now you'll remember mine. I can kill with a word. So, look, you notice the blue eyes, the blue bloods, right? Um, his mother, she gets transformed as well. She drinks the... I think she drinks the water, too. 
it's transformed when you drink their water it it basically gives you all of the memories of all of the ones before them so what is that that's demon possession right that's what it is you have all the memories and this is what the egyptians did they preserved the dna in these black or in these jars called canopic jars the dna turned into a black goo or blue blood or black blood because of its copper base because they had very because of the um breeding with one another they had the intensified bloodlines the copper was very we might not have intense and concentrated copper blood now in these bloodlines because it's been watered down over the millennia but back then what was in these canopic jars probably had a very high copper content hemocyanin based blood like some of the creatures now on this planet squid centipedes spiders they all have copper based blood hemocyanin horseshoe crabs so this is exactly what they're showing us here this is the egyptian story the canopic jars storing the dna preserving it until the end of time then you take it or they use it scientifically do through experimentation and they can reconstitute it they can recreate some of these ancient pharaohs repossess them with demons think about it if you were a demon where would you want to go would you want to just go into a regular person no you're going to want to go into some mighty ancient evil being it'll probably be easier to possess that being too than it would be to possess just a regular old person right so this all makes sense and it's being depicted and shown to us in these films but guess what I know many of you have read the books. I know many of you have seen the film Dune. This is a film that I grew up on. But nobody ever saw these deep, deep themes running through it. Until now. So what does this mean? This is the increase in knowledge in the last days. That's what this is. It's all being revealed to us. What this is really all about. So let's keep watching here. Now... At the end, the Muad'Dib, Paul Muad'Dib, the false messiah, antichrist figure, he brings water to the desert. It's actually prophesied that he would do this. He would bring water to Dune. Uh, does this all sound familiar? Like Ra? The rain, the Ra'ain man, rain man. Now, Jesus promises us eternal waters, a well of life, so that we will never go thirsty. But it's the well of the spirit. It's air. Now it's interesting because we are in the age of Aquarius. I do not follow astrology. But there's what's called precession up in the sky. And every 2,000 years a new constellation appears on the horizon. God made the constellations. Several of them are mentioned in the book of Job. The Maseroth. Arcturus. The Pleiades. Orion. They're all mentioned in the book of Job. And named by God. And he challenges Job and he says... Who can loose the bands of Orion? Only God could do that. So, what does that mean? Well, precession every 2,000 years, a new constellation appears on the horizon, going back to the beginning of creation, and, and, and a strange thing happens. The things that occurred in the Bible are actually reflected in the dominating constellation during that 2,000-year time period in biblical history. You can't make that up. You can't stretch that. Because think about it. When the Bible was written, did anyone even know what would be the constellation in the night sky? For that 2,000 year period, no, they did not. Astronomy wasn't invented until recent history. But yet, you have this bizarre overlay of events. Beginning with, and I'll go over them. I've gone over them before. I'm going to go over them off the top of my mind before we finish up this decode as I'm talking to you guys beginning with Adam and Eve the first pair Cain and Abel brothers from different fathers in the first seven generations come up for air there the first seven generations mentioned in the Bible one through Cain. 
and seven other generations through Adam, placed side by side. You can do an acrostic and connect the two from different fathers, and the names are almost the same. There are two Enochs. There are two Erads or Jared. There is a Methuselah and a Methusael. That was the age of Gemini, the twins. The next Earth age was the age of the bull. 2,000 years. And this is when Egypt worshipped the bull. Next age, the age of Aries. 2,000 years. That's when God's people were released from Egypt. And what did they sacrifice to the Most High for their sins? Lambs and goats. Aries. 2,000 years later, two fish appeared on the scene. Yeshua, Jesus Christ. He took two fish in the age of Pisces, which is the symbol for Pisces, and he fed large crowds of people. He cast nets off of boats and caught fish. His symbol was the fish. He walked on water, he turned water into wine, and he told you that you need to submerge yourself in water to be baptized. This was all about the age of Pisces. Where are we now? And this is all in order, you guys. I'm not shuffling the constellations around. This is in order. Overlays biblical history perfectly. We are in now the age of Aquarius of the Spirit. This is when I believe Jesus will return. Because he said he would return. And the, the disciples asked him before he was crucified, where shall we go to prepare for the Passover? Passing over from the flesh to the Spirit. Where did they tell, where did Jesus tell them to go to prepare for the Passover? He said, go into the upper rooms. Go into the upper room and find the man with the water jug. Which, of course, is the sign of Aquarius. He was telling them to pass over into the spirit out of this material realm upon his return. He gave them a clue that we would read later when the increase of knowledge happened in the last days and know that his return is right around the corner. Aquarius is starting any day now. Some believe it's already happened. So, wow, right? Now, let's go back to this here. And I'll give you my final thoughts on this. Do not take the false waters. Do not take the water promised here in the material realm. That's supposed to give you long life. The only water we should be taking is Jesus' promise of eternal waters. So that we'll never go thirsty. So, what are my final thoughts on Dune? Well, what does it all mean? It sounds like it's about oil, right? If you were to look at just one nested truth of the film. And it is, partially. It, it basically predicted the whole desert storm and the search for oil and all this. But it's also about the spice. The spice that is needed for time travel. So what is the spice? What is that representative of? Is the spice the oil? Well, it's a metaphor for oil. Both are mined from the ground. Energy from death, right? Energy from death. Helium and methane are gases of death, mined for power, aren't they? Oil is a source of energy through the death of other things. 
These are the metaphors for how the devil harvests our souls. Uh, didn't the prophecy say something like, He shall bruise her in the heel and she shall bruise him in the head? One of the very first prophecies in the book of Genesis in the entire Bible? Well, that's an Ouroboros. That's the dust. The snake was of the garden. His curse was that he would eat dust all the days of his life. Think of him as like a miner. What does that mean? The cursed dust. Remember God cursed the dust of Adam? Or uh, of Adam, he told him, you will toil in the dust and the dirt by the sweat of your brow. Remember he told Cain, the ground will not yield its produce because of the curse. That's death in the ground. Every time something dies, it is sent back up to heaven. In, in terms of God can hear it and feel it. Is this all starting to sink in yet? And the, the, the snake licks the dust or eats the dust. He's the one that harvests the death. Right? He gains power from it. Because that's the prison we're in. It's like a giant engine. The Ouroboros. The snake eating his tail. Now, why would, what does that mean? Well, that's time. Time, we're locked in this time loop where the devil has to, he's basically, there's no way out for him. He's basically cannibalizing himself. He's eating himself because the death is all attributed to him. All sin is attributed to the devil. This is, now is this starting to sink in? Is it starting to make sense? This is what the symbols actually really mean. They're not just symbols. A snake eating its own tail is the devil trapped inside of this time loop. The tree of good and evil. He can't escape because he's already made his bed. There is no salvation for him. Because he got humanity trapped in this tree that he rules. We have to get out of the tree. We have to go through a portal through Jesus Christ. That gets us to the other trees of the garden. And then God will shut this tree down. I mean, this is, now how do I know all this? Well, years and years of study, years and years of tens of thousands of you, your comments, whittling it down over the last decade on this channel, talking with you, understanding when we go into a rabbit hole we're not supposed to go into, coming out of it. Steel sharpens steel, doesn't it? And this isn't just something that I came up with. It's all of us been working together over the past decade. What I just described to you was the physical description of exactly what happened in the garden. Or not exactly, but close to it. Because we can't know everything, right? Only God knows everything. But there are all these clues and together it paints a picture so we're trapped in here with the snake. The devil's harvesting our souls in this giant recycling bin called life. When you die, you turn to dust. A tree grows out of your dust, bears fruit. Someone eats it. They die. It's like a giant recycling symbol. That's exactly what we're living in. And every time that happens, it degrades and degrades and degrades. And this is why humanity cannot live as long. Because every time something dies... The whole, pr the, the whole reason of death is sin, and every time that happens, it just gets more and more cursed and more and more cursed. It's like stagnant water. The, the longer it goes, it just gets worse and worse and worse, and before, after a while, it can't support life at all anymore. So, we have the oil and the spice. Yeah. If you think about it, the spice, I believe, is a metaphor for the chrome. And that's necessary for demons to pass through the portals of possession. Because they too have to pass through portals to possess people. There have to be spiritual rules. And they harvest chrome to do that. Now, if you still think I'm making all this up, uh, by this time I don't think anyone would 
assume that at this point. I'm going to try very hard to show you all the evidence. Understand that the new Dune film premiered on September 3rd. I'm going to pull that up. So you can see that we don't make anything up on this channel. 119 days left in the year. So they know what's going on. People with eyes to see know what's going on. As far as I know, though, nobody's made the connections that we made today on this. And it's not that we did it. It's the Holy Spirit and it's all the glory goes to God. It isn't because anything we did is because we're willing vessels and we yearn for the truth. We do not want to be deceived. And so therefore, God gives us the truth so we can share it with those who will listen. Let's go into the chat. That's pretty much all I had for Dune. We will be decoding the film when it comes out. All right, man, that's, that's wild. Yes, thanks, Tom. Okay. IXXI, yes, that is the Roman numerals for blind 11. Sugar and spice. Now, do you guys have any questions? Did any of that come through not as clear as it should have? Cast your net to the right. Yes, Anuki. Now, there was a mini series for those of you that are interested. I tried to watch it. There's it's only three episodes. It was from the year two thousand. And they did a miniseries on Dune. And uh, I tried to watch it. I got about 30 minutes into it and I just couldn't. But for those of you that are, you know, into research, if you want to watch that and let me know uh, if there are any Blind 11 references because it came out just a year before Blind 11. So there may be some very overt references as to what was going to happen. Because it's, remember, it's all about the cursed dust. Um, and as I was going to the, the rally Saturday, no, I probably won't be going to the rally in Connecticut, but I, hopefully we got Jonathan enough people to help make a difference. He's got billboards all over Connecticut telling people the truth about the potion and the sticker. So that's a good thing. Thanks, just me. Thanks, everybody. All, all the glory to the Most High for the revelations of these things that you've seen today. Now it's funny because uh, you know I don't, I don't really believe we can make much of a difference at these at rallies, and it does. Now I'm not trying to discourage people from going, but what it does is it opens you up for a provocateur to come in and ruin the whole thing, and then all of a sudden you become a headline on the news. This is why I don't this is why I don't really attend rallies. Now I will do sometimes like protests. I can do like a protest uh, with maybe a sign. Um, but I don't get into like these rallies and things just because look at this. Look at how they're trying to flip the script. Now tomorrow we're gonna be doing between the headlines. Tomorrow is what we're gonna work on. We've got these tabs pulled up. But look at what they're already doing here. Let's pull this up. <laughs> they're calling. They're they're actually admitting that this is a honey trap. They actually use the term honey trap here, but they're trying to reframe this and say that these people are paranoid. Look at this. Uh, we were like the only ones talking about this, you guys, weren't we? I mean, were any other channels talking about what happened at the Crapit Hole as being uh, a honey trap? I don't think really many people were. No one wants to admit that the T-Man lured them into a trap. 
I mean, there may be other channels, and I apologize if there are other channels talking about that, but, you know, we said this the day, the day that everything went down at the crap at all, we were telling you guys, don't go. This is, they're going to use this as an example. The team man sold you out. He told you to go so that they could, you know, round everybody up. They saw that things were getting out of hand domestically and people weren't buying the lie. And they want to see who would actually take action against the government. So they set this up. And look, now they're trying to flip the script on this and make it look like the people are paranoid. When this is exactly what they did. And they're going to try to do it again. And they'll keep running these honey traps until they get all the people that can make a difference. So I don't go to these things. But um, some people do. And there are different... Different levels of awakening, and I get that. But basically, they want you to come to these things so they can round you up. You're better off on the information front. And, for instance, uh, you know, they need workers right now. If 50% of the people didn't show up to work, uh, we wouldn't have an economy, would we? They would have to address it. They can't... Yeah. You need numbers. And how do you have numbers is not by walking on the street, per se. You have numbers by the mind and helping people wake up to the lie so, they don't, that, so that they walk off the field. They stop playing the game. And walking off the field doesn't mean you necessarily have to show up to, you know, a, you know, a rally. Now, I hope he gets people to go to the rally because I know Jonathan's been working very hard but you know he needs to be very careful because all it takes is one provocateur in the crowd to derail everything and all of his efforts i i like the idea of the um the banners and things like that and the billboards those are very effective because people drive down the, the freeway and they see it and they it'll make them think and there's a lot of other great things that, that jonathan is doing so, all right, what else do we have here? I guess the I guess the moral of the story is just be careful. If you go to a rally, just be careful, okay? If you see stuff to start to go down, don't participate. Walk away, you know? See someone grab somebody, walk away. If someone asks, who's Jonathan? Jonathan lives here in Connecticut, and he's been doing a lot to try to inform people about what's going on. He's standing up for religious exemptions. Um, he's, you know, trying to change things from the ground up. He's got a small channel here on YouTube. It was tiny last week, and then we started trying to help him out. I think now he's over a thousand or a couple thousand subscribers. But uh, Jonathan is doing everything he can to put up signs and billboards all over Connecticut to wake people up to what's happening. And so I, you know, I try to support people where I can. I'm living in Connecticut right now, so I figure I should try to support the guy. If I can't go to the rallies and do other things, at least I can get the word out so other people can, you know, help him get these billboards up. So. Okay, what else do we have here? Yeah, exactly, Callie. 2020 vision. It certainly feels like that. Things have become a lot clearer, to me anyway. Thanks, Warrior for Truth. Yeah, he needs a lot of prayers. Jonathan's a Christian. Yeah, I think he homeschools his children. He's a real deal. He's, he was a tiny, tiny, tiny channel. I met him once. Actually, was I was picketing. This was like a couple years ago. And, um, gosh, the vitriol, people are driving by on, you know, bikes and things. And, you know, it's just crazy how divided America is with everything. And, uh, met Jonathan, didn't know who he was. I just saw that, uh, Connecticut Liberty Rally, that's the name of his channel, was, um, had posted some stuff. I wanted to get involved somehow. And, uh, gosh, there were only like 10 of us at the, at the picketing, you know, on this corner. 
and people were driving by. We had a few honks back then, but now Jonathan has a lot more people honking in support than he did before. A lot more people. Now, what I would do, if I, if, if I was going to protest, okay, I would make it count. I wouldn't be protesting at these public buildings. I would be protesting in the neighborhoods where these people live. I'm not doing anything bad or negative. And I would camp out. Literally camp out. But, you know, it's getting cold around here, so I don't know if that, that would work. But Now, I've been trying to take stock, you know, as well. Had a had a channel that I, I really, really liked for a while. Saw, you know, started watching this channel for years when they were tiny. Now there are 2 million plus subscribers. Many of you will know who this channel is because I've talked about them from time to time over the years. Deer meat for dinner. And he came on and said that there was some guy who lives down there in Florida who he says died of CV-19. In the video was a sponsor. Uh, now, I didn't even finish watching the video because I just couldn't. Because apparently, Robert got CV-19 as well and survived it. But it's it's crazy. Like, what are we seeing on the news being paraded out? We're seeing over and over again, right-leaning people that they're telling us have come down and died from it after speaking out against the sticker. Right? Isn't that what they're trying to drill into our heads? So I don't even know if I believe it. So he, you know, about three weeks ago, Robert said that he had recovered from this CV-19, showed some clips of it, and told everyone he did not have the sticker. And then everyone was like, well, you know, you should really, uh, Tell us how you feel about the sticker, right? And he didn't say anything. He was silent. Now, if you go to that channel, you know, he, he, you'll understand why I follow the channel. I'm an outdoorsman. I like hunting and fishing. I haven't done much hunting over the years, but a lot of fishing. And I believe in self sufficiency and being able to harvest from our own nature, God given nature, and being able to sustain yourself if you had to, because there will come a day. Mark my words, that you will have to sustain yourself outside of the bee system. It's already happening now. They're slowly bringing us into a situation where we're going to really have to rely on the manna from heaven. And I'm talking figuratively and spiritually. We're going to have to rely on God's nature to survive. Because they're going to pull it all off the table. They're going to make you, you know... Scan your badge in order to enter a grocery store pretty soon. And they're going to say it's all to keep people safe. But I started watching Robert and Dear Me for Dinner because I liked his message at first. But then over the years, I started to see this trend of just accepting whatever rules Fish and Game had put out for him. But I can tell you by, you know, from personal experience that most of 90% of the rules that they put out there should not apply to individual people harvesting fish. Now, if you're a commercial fisherman and you're dragging in tons of fish every time you go out, yes, there should be rules to control that so that you don't decimate populations. But very few people who are on a single family expedition out on a boat under a certain amount of people, are going to do much to affect the population of anything wild. you just not. And so over the years, I saw him not stand up for that. I saw him, you know, just going along to get along. Not being mad at YouTube for taking away his ability to even show how to clean an animal. YouTube will unmonetize those videos. And look, people are saying, well, who cares if they unmonetize? Well, here's the thing. YouTube is running a business. We're using their service. In order for their business to stay viable, a channel has to have ads on it. That's why we have ads on our channel. 
Some people don't like that. But it's how the channel stays safe. Okay? Because what happens is if you start loading up your channel with a bunch of unmonetized videos, that raises a flag to YouTube. They go on and they go, you know what? We're going to send those views. We'd much rather just delete that channel and have all those views go to this other channel who is helping us make money. And you can call that what you want, but they are providing a service. They're the vehicle by which we can get the word out. So what do we do? We play between the rules, right? Careful how we say things. Make sure that the channel's in good standing so they can't remove our voice. So what they've done to the hunters and fishermen is they've taken away their ability to monetize any video that has to do with survival. Where they're actually cleaning an animal, actually showing someone how, if you had to, in a situation to clean an animal. Some people think that that's disgusting and gross, but think of it this way. It's already happening when you go to the supermarket and buy chicken and beef. Wouldn't you rather want to do it ethically and something that's organic and natural out in nature instead of something that's been herded into a farm and feared and put in an assembly line? Of course you would if you knew how to do it. That would be the way to do it because that's the ethical way of doing it. And I'm just giving you a little bit of snapshot into the, the way the person that I am that I've become today into my my personal beliefs okay so this is what robert did a lot of but then over the years he stopped putting up videos of cleaning the animals because youtube would unmonetize those videos and it broke my heart because he just went along with it people need to know if they had to how to trap something to survive and clean it properly Every single child, man, woman, and child in America should have learned that in school. Every single one. Think of the hypocrisy. We go to the store and buy something that someone else has done that to, but then we don't know how to do it ourselves. So we're reliant on the system. Is it starting to make sense now? So that when they put the mark out there, and say you can't buy or sell, people are just going to take it because they feel like they don't have a choice. When all they really have to do is walk four miles out into the sticks. And if they knew how, take down a deer and clean it. But nobody knows how to do that anymore. So I just felt like Robert had a real opportunity to really stand up for the truth and oppose some of these things. Not everything. You don't have to go up against, you can't, my mom said, told me once, you can't fight City Hall. And I go, mom, there's got to be a happy medium. So yeah, we can't fight City Hall, but there's something you can do. Don't just take it laying down. And Robert just took it. One time he was fined for not writing the address on a crab trap. Some idiot bureaucrat, I'm sorry found his crab trap and wrote him a like a thousand dollar fine for not writing an address on a crab trap and this is the real reason for fishing game it's to discourage the natural harvest of our god-given right which is to survive without being locked into any kind of beast system and that is blasphemy and god will bring down judgment on all of those standing in the way of being independent of the B system. You think you think not? You wait. God's fury will rain down because God sees that as a prison. It's Egypt imprisoning his people, forcing us to live in Egypt. And what did he tell the Pharaoh? Let my people go. Now, because we live in America, a lot of us have the luxury of pretending like we don't want to hurt an animal. But you wait till you get into a survival situation. Everybody remembers the survivor shows where, or uh, Naked and Afraid, or those shows where <laughs> these people come on and they're like vegetarians. And then very quickly they realize they need protein to survive in a survival situation. But because we live in America, 
which I call Disneyland, we forget that. Because you can go down to Trader Joe's and get yourself a spread of vegetables and you can eat every two hours if you want. But wait till you're in a survival situation and all there is is protein. You will eat it or you will die. So back to Robert and then I'll finish the show up here. I don't want to be on here too long because this show was really about Dune. But I had to talk about this because basically, finally, Robert addressed how he got CV-19 and he recovered and he said that someone that he knew and everybody knew in this part of Florida he had died from it this guy was like uh, you know he had a boat and everything and took people out and so by the end of the uh, of this episode Robert says You've probably been wondering what my feelings are on the sticker. And he says, if everybody would just shut up and let the doctors do what they need to do, then probably all of us would have gotten the sticker by now if this wasn't so politicized. And it just broke my heart to hear him say that. Now, he did follow that with, it should be a personal choice, but... And at that point, I was still subscribed to his channel. But then when I went down in the comment section and gave my personal experience, I said something to the effect, Robert, I was in the pharmaceutical uh, industry for 15 years as a rep. I was selling diagnostic tests. And I can tell you from personal experience that these are not the people that you want to trust. Why? Because they're the highest. They've been sued the most times of any U.S. companies in terms of volume of lawsuits and the number of lawsuits and the, the amount of the lawsuits. Why would you just give all of you, have all of your faith in something like that? And then I think in the comment I said something like, you can Google it, which you can. You can type in any of the companies. And uh, I'm being vague here because you got to be careful. And uh, you will see that the track record, you also see that all recalled um, devices and things were once approved by the by the FIDA, the F to the D to the A. So to, to just blindly say that, and also the fact that uh, doctors who speak against the narrative are getting their licenses pulled now. These are the doctors that he's told us that we should all trust. They're getting their licenses pulled. Anyway, I left that comment. It, was a, it wasn't a bad comment. I was just saying, hey, you know, I've been in the industry. I should know a little something about this. I've seen the waste. Now, if you guys want to know a little bit about Maybe I'll just explain it here. This doesn't have to be a short show today. Since we have some time. So, uh, I've mentioned this before. Uh, my pharmaceutical sales career started in the year 2001. In fact, our training class had, was interrupted by the planes hitting the towers. Uh, our, 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 home, well, what do they call it? Home office schooling, because we had to go through schooling, right? You had to pass tests and all this to be a pharmaceutical sales rep, right? Um, was delayed because of the air was shut down. Remember, air travel was shut down. So we got delayed. We ended up flying in later. At that point, I had a five year career with the first company I worked for called Organon. They no longer exist. They were bought up by, I think, Sharing Plow. And here's how it went. I think I had a budget of $20,000 a year. What did I do with that money? I would host dinners, lunches. I had some doctors that had a two-year waiting list 
to get in to provide a lunch for them. In other words, every single day of their calendar was filled up with pharmaceutical sales rep lunches. $20,000 a year budget. This was back in 2000. We did dinners, speaking engagements. Doctors were paid to become speakers. Now, we never saw how much that was, but it was some kind of honorarium. Now, just before I got into pharmaceutical sales, the farm reps were actually doing, uh, they were taking doctors to Disneyland and paying for their golf. Now, by the time I got into pharmaceutical sales, that they had done away with that because it was just too obvious at that point. So this went on. We had one major sales meeting per year where all the reps got together. Then we had a regional sales meeting where like the West Coast got together. And during these sales meetings, one of them took place in Las Vegas at the Venetian. We had Sinbad, the comedian, perform for us personally. We had Smash Mouth perform for us at a plant in, I think it was Texas, once. They shut down the Harley-Davidson plant just for our company. Had paid for Smash Mouth to come out, sing the Shrek song. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, you guys. You can't make it. And I turned my back on all this. That's why I'm here with you guys. I gave up all that. And I'm not saying that, you know... You should feel sorry for me because I don't want you to feel so I should have given it up. But when people question the integrity of this channel, I have to tell these stories because this is my past. This is why I can tell you something about the pharmaceutical industry and these companies. We had astronauts. At least one astronaut came and did a speaking engagement for us at one of our meetings. We had Jim Belushi's band come and play for us. We went to Puerto Rico one time and had a sales meeting. And it goes on. I can sit here and talk to you all day about the waste and money spent just on the sales force. Just on the sales force. And the amount of money we threw at doctors to influence them. So I know something. So when Robert deleted my comment, I tried to post it three or four times. Someone was obviously on there moderating the comments. As nice as I was, he didn't want anyone telling the truth. That's when I unsubscribed from his channel. Now, if that was some kind of mistake and Robert wants to reach out to me, he, he's more than... He can do it if he wants. Maybe I'll resubscribe, but dude, you can't silence the truth. You got to tell the people you have a responsibility on your channel. When you have 2 million people watching your channel, the fact of the matter is you have to tell the truth or at least allow people to tell the truth. So that's the story of what happened yesterday. Let's go back in the chat here. Sorry, guys. I got on a side note there. But... Uh, Talking about deer meat for dinner, seven grains. I think you had covered him in the past. Showed me some stuff on him. Robert Arrington, deer meat for dinner. So. Okay. Now, it's not to say that um, these companies don't do a lot of good, but here's my belief system. I believe that most things that happen to us are because of something else and then they fix the problem. Okay. That's what I believe is really happening. Now I can't prove that, but I can tell you that there is a lot of stuff going on that we don't know about. A lot of things causing things that they won't admit to. Okay. Okay. All right. Yes, I agree with you 100%. Can't really have 2 million subscribers and think that someone's going to tell the truth. I had a, a channel chal challenge. Uh, this channel is a really tiny channel. But one of you had come to, to my channel and said, 
AKC, someone's saying bad things about you. Normally, I don't look at that stuff. But um, this particular case, I went over to the channel. And I say, hey, what's the problem? You know, is there anything I can can I answer any of your questions? Is there anything you're concerned about? We can talk about, you know, you can't just call somebody a shill just because they have 100,000 subscribers. OK, this has been a long road. 2011, we started this channel and we pretty much uploaded videos every single week since then. Uh, all of our peers who started much later than us or at the same time, a lot of them reached four or 500,000 subscribers, 800,000 subscribers. And it's not because their work was so much better. It's because we tell the truth no matter what it costs us. And also YouTube's going around unsubscribing people by the dozens every single day. So they've kept this channel small. It's come at a cost. There's Sally Sue. Thanks, Sally. So I responded to to that channel as politely as I could, gave him some background. And so uh thanks Sally Sue for letting me know. So typically if if a channel is saying bad things about me, please just don't let me know. Cause we let's put it this way. We've sacrificed so much. So it's just another knife in the back when I hear bad things. So what you can do is when you see that channel saying bad things, say something to that channel and say, hey, look, you know, why are you saying that about him? Do you understand what Casey and all of us have been through? Do you understand this channel isn't just about Casey, that it's about all the people that come to his channel and that every single show usually is a suggestion from a subscriber? You know, say something, stick up, stand up, you know, that's what you can do. But uh, yeah, I prefer just not to see those because, you know, because we really should be wasting time on the naysayers, right? And But I have a weakness for that sometimes. So, all right. What else do we have here? Cast your burden upon the Lord. Yes, Tom. I mean, I get it, you know, um, someone starts a YouTube channel, they, you know, they're, they're in the truth community and what do they do? They look at the top channels, right? They go, oh, those guys must be shills. And a lot of them are, but you're barking up the wrong tree over here. Okay. Barking up the wrong tree. We have worked very hard. Think about it. We upload videos every single day. Look at how slowly our subscribership has grown. No channels upload every day or didn't used to. And they grew leaps and bounds instantly overnight. So, and if they did, they weren't really offering solid information. All the work that goes in these decodes. You guys, I do this by myself. Watch all this stuff. I put the clips together. I edit it. I present. Then I, and as many of you know, I'll respond to your comments. I read, try to read all the comments. I get a couple hundred emails a day if not more from all of you, uh, this is, it's a never ending story. It just keeps going on and on. I do it on the weekends. I'm usually working 70 hours a week on YouTube. I've got five or six or seven different social media sites that I have to manage too. We have a Facebook group. You know, this is not a light job. You know, this is this, I take this seriously. I'm working for the most high and he wants the enemy exposed. So I do as much as I can. Now, I'm not complaining, but when people throw out the shill word and try to compare us to a channel that pulls up one story, reads a headline, and talks about pyramids and checkerboards, you can't, you know, you can't compare us to those channels. And you guys all know it, but understand that when there's a bunch of people out there just throwing out the shill word, they're worse. They're worse than the enemy because they're causing... They're basically causing us to consume ourselves. The truth community can never grow if you've got a large contingent of the community putting the shill label on all the channels who are trying to make a difference. Okay, Now, some channels deserve that title because they've been shown and demonstrated with solid proof to be a shill, but others have not. Others might just be misguided or maybe they've got the wrong opinion on things. Okay, 
But just understand, when you're in these little side groups, these little side channels that just like to throw out the shill button all the time, that, that's, that's toxic. It's toxic. Okay? Very toxic. And it's not helping channels like mine who are out trying to get the word out to everybody. You know? Because then I got to handle this stuff. And I don't like spending my time doing that. I like my time spent attacking the enemy and exposing them and getting people to wake up to this agenda that we are being marched towards. The world has changed, you guys. Even in the last 10 years, it has changed tremendously. They're marching us toward an agenda. And if you don't see that, then, then you, you, you know, you're not awake. It's getting worse and worse every week that goes by. The grip is tightening. The snake is tightening his grip. All right, I've talked enough today. I love you guys. Thanks, Barry, a cat, Susie, Nancy, Tom. Thanks for Watchman Study, Denise. Thanks, you guys, for coming out. And thanks, Tom, for moderating. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that name. Re Redeemed by Yah, Tanya, Starlight. Yes, they basically kicked us out, but we're still here. Through the grace of God, very careful in what we say. And how we say things. And we're still able to have a voice here. But it's very, you know, it could end any day. Any day. Love each and every one of you guys. Have a great day. Take care. Be safe.